Chapter Fifteen of the World's Lumber Room by Selina Gay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fifteen: Animal Scavengers, Crustaceans, Birds, and Mammals. What becomes of the dead bodies of the polar bears, reindeer, birds, etc., which exist in thousands and millions and must die in untold numbers? Professor Nordenskjöld asks the question, but does not answer it, though he says that self-dead animals are so rarely seen in the Arctic regions that it is easier to obtain fossil bones than recent ones. Evidently, therefore, the scavenging is very thoroughly done by some means or other. Mr. Bates is equally struck with its thoroughness in another department, namely in the fresh-water pools or lakes on the upper Amazons. How elaborate must be the natural processes of self-purification in these teeming waters, he says, quote, for the water is quite pure, no scum of confervy or trace of animal decomposition is to be seen on the surface, no foul smell is ever perceptible, and the whole of the level land is most healthy instead of being covered with malaria-breeding swamps. End quote. Much of this scavenging is no doubt accomplished, as has already been said, by vegetation, and much also by the various protozoa, multitudes of which exist everywhere in still water. But to go on to creatures whose labours we are better able to appreciate, among the most active coast scavengers must be reckoned the great army of the crustacea, all of which are flesh eaters, from the water flea to the lobster and all, it would seem, voracious, though some are more particular than others. The sandhopper, for instance, will feed on almost anything which is soft and capable of decay, and does not despise a meal of seaweed. The crab will eat only fresh food, and putrid bait is reserved by the fisherman for the lobster, which is said to prefer its food highly seasoned. The thousands of little creatures exactly like common wood lice which swarm about cliffs and piers are vegetable feeders and will devour, according to Frank Buckland, the planks of boats and eat up sails and nets if these are left undisturbed for any time. But the sea lice eat animal food and, quote, in the United Service Museum are some very perfect skeletons of seabirds, end quote, made by them in the Arctic regions. Quote, the birds were let down into the sea to an immense depth and left there twenty-four hours. These bones are as white as ivory. End quote. Though they do not come under the head of crustaceans, we must here mention that tadpoles are likewise good skeleton makers, and that very perfect skeletons of small animals are sometimes found made by them in ponds. Tadpoles will eat up a dead kitten and will also condescend to decayed vegetable matter, but when other food fails, they turn cannibals and prey upon one another. Among the lesser freshwater scavengers are certain little long narrow worms with which dead and even sickly fishes are often found to be covered. But to return to the crustaceans, among which the common shrimp is preeminent as a capital skeleton maker. So voracious is he that he is called, par excellence, the scavenger of the ocean. But the crab, both in water and on land, is an equally diligent consumer of dead animals. And among crabs, one of the most useful is the thornback spider crab, which, though he does good service in the sea, is more especially useful along the coast, thanks to his large appetite and the keen sense which guides him unerringly to his food. But for his labours the seashore would often be anything but a charming recreation ground, for the sands would be strewn with the dead bodies of unsaleable fish, as well as with the offal resulting from the processes of skinning and dressing often performed there by fishermen. As it is, however, the crabs arrive in such myriads and work so busily that by the next tide hardly a trace of anything unpleasant remains, though bones picked perfectly clean may be seen strewing the sand in numbers, showing how abundant the banquet has been. 
the spider crab, assisted by others of different species, sets to work boldly, holding on to the fish with one claw, and with the other tearing off the flesh and conveying it to its mouth with the regularity of clockwork or of a Chinaman plying his chopsticks. So strong and sharp are its claws that no muscle is tough enough to withstand them, and the fish bones are cleaned as thoroughly as if they had been scraped by a knife. But in the process a number of minute fragments are detached, which, though too small for the large pincers of the crab, would yet make their presence very unpleasantly felt if they were left to decay. This, however, is not the fate of these tiny scraps, for the crab carries with it a whole army of lesser scavengers, for which this mincemeat is exactly adapted. These are various small zoophytes, such as the sea fur, etc., which attach themselves to its armour, sometimes in such numbers as to entirely cover both body and limbs, and thus are always on the spot to clear up the relics of the feast. Crabs will devour any kind of animal food that comes in their way, and on the desolate St. Paul's rocks, which are tenanted only by countless multitudes of seabirds, they quickly pick the bones of any dead individual. Eels also feed on carrion, and most fishes are as ready to eat the dead as the living, so that any carcass which is washed into the sea or even left near shore is soon disposed of. The large white-winged Glaucus gull, which builds in Greenland and Iceland and comes as far south as Shetland in the winter, resorts to the entrances of the more exposed bays, or waits about a few miles from shore in attendance on the fishing boats to pick up the offal thrown out of them. The Dutch call it the Burgermaster, or Chief Magistrate, of the birds in Spitsbergen, where it follows the whale fishers in company with the fulmer petrel and kittiwake, or ivory gull, which it forces to give up their most dainty morsels whenever it takes a fancy to them. It is very dexterous in carrying off its food on the wing. The common gull may frequently be seen hunting for refuse on any sandy flats, such as those about the Thames, but the skewer gull is seldom seen so far south. It also feeds on dead whales and other carrion, but it is a bird of low and disgusting character, justly called the parasite, for it is supported by the labour of others and harasses the smaller gulls which it obliges to disgorge their prey to satisfy it. The fulmar petrels follow in the wake of the whalers as soon as they have passed the Shetland Isles, being very greedy of whale fat, and as soon as a whale is cut up they flock together in thousands and follow the boats boldly at the distance of but a few yards. When carrion is scarce they follow the living whale, and so point out his whereabouts to the fishermen. But should a dead whale chance to be stranded anywhere, they cannot make much impression on the carcass till some more powerful bills have torn away the skin. In New Jersey, the black-headed gull haunts the neighbourhood of farmhouses and river banks, picking up garbage and other refuse of the fishermen, and about the middle of May great multitudes assemble in the Delaware Bay to feed on the remains of the king crabs left by the hogs. Gulls are the vultures of the ocean, and besides keeping careful watch over the labours of whalers and fishermen, may be seen in numbers following a shoal of porpoises, and picking up the bitten and wounded fishes which the porpoises themselves have not time to do when going full chase after their prey. Vultures, though chiefly frequenting warm countries, are found more or less all over the world and though most of them are disgusting in their ways and unpleasant both to sight and smell, are almost everywhere protected in civilised countries for the sake of the great services they render. In the south of Europe they are kept in the marketplaces, as storks are in Holland, and for the same purpose, to eat up the garbage, and being protected by heavy penalties are extremely familiar and independent and at Natchez swarm in such numbers that all the refuse of the place is not enough to feed them. The vultures indeed do their scavenging on a more extensive scale than either the dogs of Constantinople or the storks of India and Holland. 
the largest of all the vultures are the great bearded vulture or lemur gyre and the great condor of the andes about which so many exaggerated stories have been told they are of about equal size averaging from eight to nine feet across the wings both seem to prefer carrion and are invaluable scavengers but will kill their prey when necessary and are looked upon as foes by shepherds and herdsmen the favourite haunts of the condor are the regions of perpetual snow from which it seldom descends and the lemmergeier frequents the alps and higher mountains of europe a variety of it being also found in many parts of africa where it is called daddy longbeard bruce the traveller mentions that on one occasion when he was cooking his dinner on a mountain top one of these birds boldly swooped down and put its foot into the pot where some goat's flesh was boiling but not being prepared for the heat withdrew it again speedily being very fearless however it at last managed to carry off a leg and a shoulder from the dish when shot it was found to measure eight feet four inches across the wings the egyptian or alpine vulture which inhabits europe asia and africa being nearly white is called white crow by the dutch and white father by the turks a pair are attached to every group of natives in south africa and are to a certain extent domesticated being perfectly harmless and very useful in clearing the premises of offal in the east they walk fearlessly about in the streets helping the pariah dogs and eating almost anything about cairo where it is considered a breach of order to kill them they are called pharaoh's hens they are plentiful in turkey arabia and persia and are always to be seen about the camps and cantonments in india but they also frequent the alps and pyrenees and all the countries bordering on the mediterranean just as gulls follow ships so do these vultures follow the caravans across the desert in the hope that something in the shape of a worn-out camel may turn up to their advantage it is said that during the war between france and england in the last century the sharks learnt to know when a naval engagement was about to take place and would assemble in the neighbourhood to be in readiness and in a similar way it was noticed that during the french occupation of egypt the vultures became so well acquainted with the meaning of the roar of artillery that they would flock together from all quarters as soon as the first gun was fired footnote it is extraordinary writes frank buckland quote, how soon animals and birds find out where there is anything to eat the regiment to which i belong very frequently marches down to wormwood scrubs for field days upon arriving at the scrubs i have not seen a single rook but the rooks very soon appear they come to pick out what they can from the dung of the horses and the bits of bread which drop out of the paper in which the men carry their refreshment the rooks always go to the place where the regiment has dismounted as there they find most to eat these rooks come i believe from the trees in holland park they certainly often arrive from that direction End quote. Egyptian vultures are the most conspicuous birds in the island of St. Vincent, and outside the town of Porto Grande may be seen hunting over the heaps of refuse in company with ravens and crows, or lazily perched, half a dozen together, on the carcass of a horse or bullock which has been carelessly half buried in the shingle, or, more carelessly still, merely flung out of the town to pollute the air far and near until these scavengers have disposed of it having gorged themselves according to custom until they are unable to fly they will just flutter off a few yards when disturbed but will not trouble themselves to do more the aura vulture popularly known as the turkey buzzard from its resemblance to the farmyard gobbler is found wherever the country is moderately damp on the coast of patagonia it lives solely on what the waves throw up dead seals and the like and each herd of seals is sure to have a turkey buzzard watching it attentively in hot countries it is a great blessing 
and enjoys the protection of the American Spaniards, to whom it is very useful, since it haunts the slaughterhouses, walking about as tamely as the barn door fowl, and eating up all the refuse. To the planter it is also welcome, and the day after the customary burning of the trash in the cane fields, it is sure to be there feeding on the snakes, lizards, frogs, and other animals which have been stifled by the smoke. It also did inestimable service, says Mr. Waterton, during the plague in Malaga, for it was impossible to bury the dead, and though they were thrown into the sea, many were washed on shore again, and when the wind blew landwards might have produced a second pestilence, but for the vultures which came down from the hills. The king of the vultures, a bird with bare head and neck, which are coloured rich scarlet on both sides, is so called from the respect with which he is treated by the common vultures, none of whom seem inclined to begin their meal until he has finished his, though as many as a score may be present watching him, and will fall too eagerly when he has withdrawn. In England the chief scavenger birds, besides the gull, are the raven, magpie, hooded or royston crow, and the carrion crow, which is, in fact, a small raven but the last two are so destructive that in some places a price has been put upon their heads. The hooded crow frequents marshes near the sea, and the banks of tidal rivers such as the Thames, where it may be seen within a few miles of London. In the western isles of Scotland, flocks of five hundred may be seen in the month of June, and, like the carrion crow, feed on dead fish and refuse of any kind, but also on living mollusks, as cockles, mussels, and the like, which they drop from a height in order to break their shells. Crows are widely distributed in most parts of the world, the raven being the most conspicuous member of the tribe. It is widely known north of the equator, and is protected in Bengal and unmolested in Egypt. It is an indiscriminate feeder, and while on the coast it subsists on dead fishes, in the polar regions it follows the herds of bison and reindeer, ready to take advantage of any that may be disabled by accident or killed by wild beasts. No sooner has an animal been slaughtered by the huntsman than crows arrive in numbers. It is also a constant attendant at the fishing stations, and in North America, where it abounds, it robs the hunter's traps, and in the United States, Whenever the deer are hunted without dogs, it arrives to take part in the sport, and, not satisfied with what rightfully falls to its share, obliges the huntsman to be very careful in concealing such game as they are unable to remove from the woods, as its scent is very keen. The raven of Mexico and South Africa is of a different and larger species than that known in the north. In South America it seems to be altogether wanting, but its place is well supplied by the numerous caracaras and the gallinazo. The latter, called also vulture hota, black vulture, zopilote, urubu, and carrion crow, is of the size of a peahen, and together with the condor and king vulture, belongs to the small family of flesh-bearded vultures. The gallinazo, though seldom seen on the Atlantic north of Newburn in North Carolina, is said to be found at Detroit, Lake Erie, and is very common in the south, where it ranges as far as Cape Horn. Its preference is for a damp climate or the neighbourhood of water, and it abounds throughout the pampas, is preserved as a scavenger in Peru, and is generally protected by law throughout tropical America. In many of the towns and villages of the southern states it is as common as poultry, and may be seen sauntering in the streets, loitering indolently for hours at a time in one place, or sunning itself on the roofs and fences, and cowering over the chimneys if the weather be cold. The townspeople, though disgusted by its filthy voracity, and particularly by a most unpleasant habit of disgorging its food down their chimneys sometimes, when it has eaten too much, yet respect it as a valuable scavenger, and accordingly it is protected either by law or custom. Don Uloa speaks of the Galinazo as familiar in Cartagena, which it cleanses of all animal impurities, 
and calls it an excellent provision of nature for in that hot damp climate the effluvium arising from putrefaction would be quite intolerable in the town of savannah it walks about in great numbers devoting especial attention to the quarter inhabited by the hog butchers but it is said also to scent or in some way to discover carrion at a distance of three or four leagues its sight is certainly extraordinarily keen for when compelled to search for food it rises to such a height as to dwindle down to a hardly visible black speck yet from that vast distance it watches intently the movements of both animals and hunters knowing well that the latter often kill a bison for the sake of its skin and marrow bones and leave the carcass for its benefit the turkey buzzard will wait and watch its food not condescending to touch it until it is well seasoned but the gallinazo is less fastidious a horse having dropped down and died in the streets of charleston the carcass was dragged out to the suburb of hampstead where in a short time it was covered and surrounded by a dense crowd of these so-called carrion crows many of which sat on the tops of sheds fences and houses while several hovered in the air overhead and at a distance at one time two hundred and thirty seven were counted but probably this does not represent the whole number for the ground was simply black with them for the space of a hundred yards on all sides of the carcass thirty-seven were upon and immediately around it so that scarcely an inch of it was visible and several were inside presenting a most savage appearance as they from time to time emerged three or four dogs were assisting at the scene growling and snapping when the wings of the crows flapped them but though the birds sprang up for a moment they were not alarmed and did not disturb themselves even when the dog's master advanced near enough to order them home though always bold and generally protected the gallinazo does not seem to meet with quite such friendly treatment in villanova as elsewhere perhaps because license has made it too troublesome it assembles in great numbers in the villages mr bates tells us about the end of the wet season and is then so ravenous with hunger that it is not safe to leave the open kitchen for a moment while the dinner is cooking some of the birds are always loitering about watching their opportunity and the instant the cook's back is turned they will march in and lift the lids of the saucepans with their beaks the boys of the village lie in wait and shoot them with bow and arrow and the vultures have come to have such a dread of these weapons that a bow suspended from the rafters of the kitchen is often enough to keep them off as the dry season advances multitudes of them follow the fishermen to the lakes where they stuff themselves with the offal of the fisheries and when towards february they return to the villages they are not nearly so ravenous as before their summer trips in south america when the gallinazo has begun the feast the bones are picked clean by two species of caracara or carancha which from their structure are called eagles though in habit they resemble the carrion crow the larger of these two the brazilian caracara swarms in the desert between the negro and colorado where it watches the line of road to devour the carcasses of exhausted animals it is most numerous on the grassy savannas of la plata but also frequents the sterile plains of patagonia and although these false eagles rarely kill their prey any one who falls asleep on the plains will see on awaking that he has been watched with evil eye by a caracara perched on each hillock near him like the gallinazo it is to a certain extent domesticated and constantly attends the slaughter-houses while several will accompany a hunting party the other species of caracara called chimango is much smaller and is generally the last to leave a skeleton and may often be seen like a bird in a cage running about within the ribs of a cow or horse it is extraordinarily tame and fearless haunts the neighbourhood of houses for offal and if a hunting party kills an animal it soon assembles in numbers 
standing on the ground on all sides and waiting patiently until its turn comes. It will readily attack wounded birds, and several together will even seize a cormorant. It is a mischievous and very inquisitive bird, and Mr. Darwin mentions that it would not only tear the leather from the rigging and carry off meat or game hung up in the stern of the vessel, but would also pick up almost anything from the ground, and on one occasion carried a large black glazed hat nearly a mile, and on another took away a small compass in a red Morocco case which was never recovered. All the carrion birds are commonly protected in tropical America, and so also in the eastern hemisphere is the Arabian kite, which haunts human habitations and pays a visit to every house in the village to which it attaches itself. At St. Jago, says Mr. Mosley, a flock of kites will come swooping about the ships to pick up garbage, which they seize in their claws with wonderful precision, putting out one foot to snatch the morsel, and then bending their heads and eating it at once on the wing. This manoeuvre is not always a safe one, however, as a shark will sometimes snap at the bird's foot and pull it under the water. In India, the Brahma kites, or Bromley kites, as the sailors call them, haunt the ships with similar intent and are extremely bold. On one occasion, as a ship's steward was carrying a hot steak from the galley to the cabin, a kite swooped down on him, caught up the meat with its foot, and was off again in an instant, leaving the man bespattered with gravy. These kites also frequent the places where the Parsees expose their dead. The Argala, or Adjutant, a bird of the stork tribe, has obtained the latter title from the fact of its being a constant visitor to the parade grounds in India, and presenting a resemblance to the dress and dignified walk of the military officer of the same name. The bird, however, also condescends to make itself generally useful by cleaning the streets. This it does most thoroughly, for its appetite is large, and it can accommodate a full-grown cat or a leg of mutton without difficulty. The great white stork, about which the Germans and Dutch have so many pretty fancies, is a well-known summer visitor in many parts of Europe, and besides consuming offal, helps to keep within bounds the swarm of frogs with which Holland would otherwise be overrun. It walks fearlessly about the streets and fish markets, and builds its nests on the top of almost every pillar in the ruined cities of the East. We must conclude this brief account of the principal scavenger birds by mentioning that the domestic duck is as greedy a consumer of filth as any vulture, and does not shrink even from devouring her own deceased kindred when opportunity offers. Much the same may also be said of the pig, which will eat garbage and even carrion of any kind, and is therefore too often converted into a domestic scavenger by unthinking people who put tainted meat, decaying vegetables, sour food and refuse of all kinds into that often terrible receptacle, the pig tub, and then expect their pig to convert its evil-smelling contents into wholesome or at least eatable and saleable pork for them. Rats are in general miscellaneous feeders, and when pressed by hunger will eat almost anything. But the Norway rat, as it is called, which has nearly exterminated the old English black rat, frequents the premises of bone boilers and knackers as well as the sewers. Originally a native of India or Persia, it seems to have moved on into European Russia, whence it has been carried by merchant ships all over the world, and wherever it has been introduced has speedily ousted the native rats. The black rat lives chiefly in the ceilings and wainscots of houses, etc., does not affect such low places as pigsties and cellars, and is but rarely found in the sewers, where the Norway rat swarms. The rat, though one of the most despised and tormented animals, is yet, says Mr. Buckland, a most useful servant, for wherever man settles, there, as if by magic, the rat makes his appearance. Thousands of rats lived in the camp before Sebastopol, 
and they swarm at Aldershot, where the sentries see them at night going to the nearest water to drink, for the rat is a thirsty animal, and soon dies if kept without water. The rat clears away every particle of refuse and filth he can get at, and does invaluable service not only in camp, but in the sewers adjoining some of the London slaughterhouses, which are often nearly choked with offal and refuse animal matter thrown into them by the careless butchers. But for the persecuted rats who live there in swarms and devour every morsel, this putrid mass, if left neglected, would give rise to fearful plagues. The rat is the only animal which can thrive and keep a clean coat in the most filthy localities where the air would be fatal to any other creature, and in spite of the unclean places he frequents, he is personally very particular about cleanliness, and never eats a morsel of food without cleaning himself, nor does the garbage upon which he feeds poison his teeth, as has been said, or render the wounds he inflicts with them deadly. Rats have very sharp teeth, and are so fond of taking a nibble at the tip of an elephant's tusk that much of the ivory imported bears evidence of having been gnawed by them. Indian ivory they will not touch, because it is deficient in animal glue or gelatin, and of the African they taste only the best tusks, and of these only the purest and most delicate portion. And the turner, well knowing that he may trust to their judgment, chooses a tusk which the rats have gnawed when he wants a specially good bit of ivory. Mr. P. L. Simmons mentions that rats are, or were, turned to account in another way in Paris, where there is a large pound covering some ten acres of ground and surrounded by a stone wall, to which all dead carcasses are brought. The bones of the animals are valuable, and so, of course, are their hides, but they must be freed from the flesh, and how to get rid of this in a sufficiently expeditious, economical and inoffensive way was a difficulty, until someone suggested that rats might be employed. They were accordingly introduced by thousands, and did the work required of them to perfection, for a dead horse put in at night would be found turned into a neat and even polished skeleton by the morning. Among field scavengers must be reckoned the hedgehog, which feeds on animal and vegetable refuse, devours dead game which the sportsman has lost, and probably puts out of their misery such wounded creatures as have escaped the dogs and have crept into some hole to die. But of all the mammalia, the most genuine carrion feeders are the canidae, or dog tribe, and the hyenas. Though undoubtedly of great use, they are not perfect scavengers, inasmuch as they prefer their food tainted, and hence their own odour, like that of the vultures, is disgusting. The pariah dogs are a feature of eastern cities too well known to need much remark. In Ceylon they are not natives, but European mongrels, a most miserable race, having no owners, living on the refuse of streets and sewers, and subject, as the reward for their services throughout the year, to a general annual massacre to keep down their numbers. As for the celebrated dogs of Constantinople, to whom the scavenging of that city is mainly left, they are creatures with whom, as a traveller wrote to us a few years ago, quote, all well-conducted sprigs of canine nobility would indignantly refuse to recognise any connection. They have four legs and a weakness for barking and biting, but here all resemblance to their European namesakes abruptly ceases. Here they are the lords of creation, and though in all conceivable stages of manginess and disease, are suffered to lie unmolested in the middle of the streets, and receive a sort of superstitious homage from their Turkish masters. Not indeed that they have any recognised owners, they are the fourth estate of the empire, and exercise, so at least it is said, a considerable influence on the sanitary arrangements of the capital. They have no fixed abode, at least in the eyes of the inhabitants, 
but nevertheless among themselves the city is portioned out into numerous and well-defined districts and woe to the dog who trespasses on his neighbour's territory his life unless he beat a speedy and ignominious retreat is not worth five minutes purchase though held in veneration by the turks they receive no regular meals and consequently are compelled to have recourse occasionally to an extremely sparse and delicate diet i saw one to-day making his midday meal off a couple of cherries and a rain puddle in personal appearance they are between a fox and a wolf in disposition easily roused snappish and cunning in taste omnivorous their dismal concert which takes place every night and is never postponed by reason of the inclemency of the weather or the sore throats of any member of the company constitutes an effectual antidote to the sleep of those whose notion of music is not based on the growl and the howl End quote. the wild pariah dogs of india frequent the jungles and the lower ranges of the himalayas in numerous packs and whenever there is any fighting going on they are sure not to be far off all the scavenger dogs of eastern cities even the mongrels of colombo seem to a certain extent to follow the example of their constantinople kindred and divide the streets and lanes into districts in eighteen forty four the dogs of alexandria had become so numerous and troublesome that mehemet ali banished them in a body to an island at the mouth of the nile but no sooner were they gone than their place was taken by a swarm of dogs from the suburbs and the nuisance became so much worse than before that the banished dogs were recalled and very speedily put the interlopers to flight under the head of the canidae come both the jackal and the wolf the former of which though he waits respectfully for the tiger to finish his meal stands in no such awe of the vultures with which he will dispute the remains of the carcasses snapping at them in defence of his rights it is a very bold animal when pressed by hunger and will not only follow the hunters and shamelessly take possession of their game but will enter the streets of towns under cover of the night eat the offal and visit the hen-roosts and even the larders devouring everything it can find in the way of provisions whether it be carrion or only cooked vegetables it has also a taste for fruit and a pack of two hundred will sometimes pay an evening visit to a vineyard the prairie wolf will also follow a hunting party but much more cautiously than the jackal and so suspicious is it that the sight of a stick planted in the ground with a strip of calico fluttering from the top will be enough to prevent it from carrying off the dead game of all scavengers none is more horribly repulsive in appearance or more disgusting in its ways than the hyena yet mr wood calls it the very saviour of life and health in asia and africa and declares it to be a libel on the animal to say that it is incapable of being tamed there are several species and from the immense quantity of fossil remains hyenas would seem to have been still more numerous in former ages and to have been almost the sole scavengers of the great mastodon mammoth etc with its extraordinarily powerful teeth it does all the rough work of scavenging in the desert in the forest on the beach crushing with ease such bones as would resist the strength of any other animal and finishing up even the hides and other tough morsels left by them it has been known to drag a dead camel above a mile from the caravan in the course of a single night but probably in this case two or three or perhaps more acted together when they are too numerous to find sufficient carrion for their support they become terrible pests hanging on the outskirts of villages and encampments even roaming through the streets at night and carrying off not only cattle but sleeping children it is a very cowardly creature and is afraid to touch any animal unless it takes to flight and thus the sickly often escape by standing still while the strong fly and perish with its horrible voice offensive odour 
great personal uncleanness and cowardice, together with its habit of digging up the dead and attacking domestic animals and human beings where it can do so with safety, it is universally detested, notwithstanding its important services. The felidae, or cats, great and small, wild and domestic, may be reduced by circumstances to eat almost anything but since they prefer to catch and kill their prey, they cannot be considered as genuine scavengers, though the panther eats carrion when other food is scarce, and the lion of Algeria actually haunts the neighbourhood of towns and satisfies his hunger with the garbage of all sorts flung outside the walls. However, nature's scavengers, though they unquestionably do a vast amount of good by preserving the air from pollution, and ridding the earth of that which is disgusting to sight and scent, cannot generally be called perfect. Some are disgusting in themselves, and others do so much mischief by their want of discrimination that many people are disposed to find fault with them, and to question their title to be looked upon as benefactors at all. But, in the first place, surely nature's workmen can be fairly judged only where they have to deal with nature alone, and are not brought into contact with civilization. And secondly, if they transgress the bounds within which they are useful to man, whose fault is that? End of chapter 15